morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are joining us uh, for this, uh, what, what promises to be a very wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Pierce Paul Kreisman. It's my pleasure to serve as the Executive Director of the American Center of Research, and it's our pleasure uh, to have a wonderful speaker with us here, uh, Professor David Vila, who will talk to us, uh, as we'll see in a moment, just a couple of our, our ordinary business matters before we get started. Uh, we won't stand in your way too long. We know why you're here. Uh, for any of you joining us, uh, watching on YouTube later, uh, thank you for watching. Don't for forget to subscribe because that's how you can find out about things like this. Our next le lecture, Kaseir Amra, the Pandora's Box of Early Islamic Aesthetics, which will be on the 9th of November, again at 7 p.m. Uh, Amman local time. If you want to keep on our most current goings on, uh, please don't hesitate to join our mailing list. You can get on our monthly electronic updates uh, on our, our newsletter, which comes out twice a year, or any combination thereof uh, you pick, and that's what we will, uh, that's what we'll send you. Uh, so that said, uh, it's now uh, truly my pleasure introduction in, no problem. Uh, but we will make sure to get it all updated when we put it online and get the text up there. We're very grateful to have you here with us. Uh, we're exceedingly uh, pleased to, to hear about excavating uh, Abila, and uh, go ahead and take it away, sir. I'm going to stop my screen share, and let's open up to yours. Okay. Uh, well, uh, to begin, I'd like to thank uh, our friends at the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. Uh, both in the Amman office and the many who work out of the offices in Irbid, Beit Ras, and Umqais, who over the past 40 years have shown uh, nothing but support and encouragement in the work that being done at Abila of the Decapolis in northern Jordan. Um, the American Center of Research in Amman has also been um, an invaluable so source of support and assistance over the years. In addition, David Kennedy and his colleagues at the Aerial Photographic Archive for Archaeology in the Middle East have produced excellent aerial photographs of our site, which given our proximity to the Syrian border are difficult to obtain otherwise. And finally, I also want to thank John Brown University for financial and institutional support of the excavation over the past decade. Our proposed summer 2022 season of excavation at Abila of the Decapolis in northern Jordan will, will mark 42 years and 19 seasons of excavation at this important Decapolis site by the American team of the Abila Archaeological Project. Work began at Abila in 1980 under the lead of Harold Mayer of Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and continued under him until his passing in 2004. The excavation was then directed by David Chapman, also of Covenant Seminary, until 2008. I've been working with the Abila Archaeological Project since 1990 and was named director of the excavation with our 2020-2010 season. Uh, from its founding, uh, the Abila Archaeolog Archaeological Project was incorporated in the United States as an independent uh, nonprofit organization with a board of directors um, uh, who provided funding and general guidance for the uh, excavation. In 2013, the Abila Archaeological Project was adopted by John Brown University, an independent liberal arts university in Northwest Arkansas, and is now an official program run by the university. An endowment was also set up at John Brown University to provide funding uh, for the ongoing work of the excavation, especially supporting the production of final publications in the conservation, preservation, and restoration uh, of the site. Uh, the future of the work at Abila looks bright, but before I get too far, I'd like to present a survey of where we've come from and what we're cur currently doing at Abila of the Decapolis. The site is located in Northwest Jordan, approximately 20 kilometers east of the Jordan Valley and five kilometers south of the Wadi Yarmouk. We are 20 kilometers north of the modern city of Irbid and along with Pella, Tawket Tab Fal, uh, Gadera, Umqais, uh, Capitolius, Beit Ras, and uh, to the east a bit further, Um al Jamal, form an important northern constellation of significant archaeological sites in northwest Jordan. It is my hope, and I believe that of uh, others, uh, that in time the discoveries and restoration presentation work being done at these important sites will draw more and more tourists north beyond Jerash. In the first two seasons of excavation at Abila, work focused on surveys of the site. Uh, the coverage of the initial survey in 1980 was deemed to include a little over 20% of the entire site, working out from what was thought to be the city center. The survey produced a total of just over 33,000 sherds dating from the early bronze period through the modern period. 
Somewhat surprisingly, of the total shirts that were collected, nearly 95% were located between the 4th and 8th centuries CE. Excavation since that time has not yielded numbers quite so high for those periods of occupation, but nonetheless, these do appear to be the periods of densest occupation at the site. The intent of this initial survey was to locate areas of interest in what was thought to be the center of the city. During the summer of 1982, a regional survey was conducted by, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Michael Fuller of St. Louis Community College that, that attempted to locate the site of Abila within the broader settlement patterns of the area. This survey laid out four transects, transects extending 2.5 kilometers from the urban center of the site. Among the findings were several farmsteads, a wine press, animal pens, many tombs, uh, various cisterns, several, several water tunnels, among many other indicators that there was a substantial suburban population surrounding Abila, especially during the late Roman and Byzantine periods, with occupation in various areas stretching from early bronze down to the Ottoman period. From work done by Michael Fuller and more recently by Bernard Luke, uh, population estimates for the site at its peak ranged from between 10 and 15,000 people, based primarily on the size of the urban footprint, water supplies, and the excavated tombs. After these initial surveys were, uh, were completed, excavation focused on the apex of uh, the north and south tells where it was clear that there was significant occupation. In time, excavation uncovered one large basilica on the north tell, uh, two basilicas on the south tell, one more just east of the south tell, and then one more down by the Roman bridge east of the north tell. There's also what appears to be a Christian monastic complex in what we call area B that we are tentatively dating to the late seventh or early eighth century and a bath complex labeled area C. On the north tell, the deep probe was begun in the late 1980s to try to trace the occupational history of the site back to its origins. Excavation in Area A traced a continuous occupation on the North Tell from the Early Bronze Period down to the Abbasid or Early Medieval Period. In addition, approximately 15 kilometers of water tunnels have been mapped stretching from nearby springs to the center of the site, and dozens of tunes have been excavated, some with excellent examples of uh, painting and wall carvings. All of these areas of excavation were begun under the directorship of Dr. Mayer. Uh, one of my primary goals as director has been to complete what Dr. Mayer began, uh, which is no small feat in light of the fact that he had as many as a dozen areas of excavation open at the site in some seasons. Since his passing, no new areas of excavation have been opened, leaving much work for future generations of excavators to accomplish. Work on the North Tell began, um, uh, which was labeled Area A, began in 1982, and it soon became clear that the structure was a Byzantine basilica with si significant earlier and later use. In 1994, a life-size statue of Diana Artemis was found in the area, and so excavators have assumed that the area uh, was once home to a Roman temple. In addition, coins minted at Abila, all of which date between the middle of the second and the first quarter of the third century CE, commonly depict a large Roman temple at the site. Most of the excavation at the Basilica in Area A was done during the 1990s, but one final season was needed in 2006 to answer a few lingering questions, namely our quest for some clear indication of Roman occupation. That season, we excavated uh, a few sealed loci beneath the limestone paved plaza just south of the Basilica and encountered clean late Roman pottery calls dating that plaza at least to the period in which we hypothesized there was a Roman temple. Although several early seasons of excavation at the Basilica on the North Tell were directed by various archaeologists, most of the area was excavated by Dr. John Wineland. The structure is a triapsidal basilica with all three apses facing east and measures 35 meters from the outer edge of the central threshold to the outside edge of the central salient apse and 20 meters from the outside edges of the north and south walls. Excavation in 1992 focused on the western edge of the basilica and an atrium measuring 16 by 20 meters was uncovered, paved with the larger three centimeter square tessera commonly found in the atriums of churches at Avila. Wineland proposed that the church continued in use until the massive earthquake uh, struck the region in the middle of the 8th century, after which it was used for domestic occupation into the early medieval or Abbasid period. Somewhat surprisingly, no dated inscriptions have been found in any of the five churches at Avila, and four of them, including the Area A church, have no inscriptions relating to the church whatsoever. The only inscription found in Area A was what we call the Abila Stone, 
a limestone fragment with an inscription that mentions a bila. Uh, Pierre-Louis Gautier uh, has written recently of the discovery at Jerash of an inscription that bears significant similarities to our abila stone, such that he suggests that the author of the epigram in the inscription at Jerash likely also authored that on our abila stone. The lack of datable inscriptions at the site has made sequencing the construction of the church at Abila a very difficult task. As soon as funds are available, our plan is to construct a shelter over the area A Basilica, and to the extent that we're able, restore and reconstruct the Opus Hectili flooring. Uh, finally, adjacent to Area A, a deep probe was begun in the late 1980s to trace the occupational history of the North Tell. That probe has revealed an, a continuous occupation from early Bronze period down to the early, early medieval or Abbasid period on the North Tell. The Area D church, located on the South Tell, uh, often called Umul Ahmed, was first excavated beginning in 1984. Initial squares located several capitals, a few with inscribed crosses and numbers of tumbled columns. From the direction and lay of the columns and from depressions in the floor surfaces uncovered in later seasons, the excavators concluded that the church likely suffered catastrophic damage during the mid-century earthquake. As seasons progressed, this structure was determined to be a triapsidal church with all the apses facing east. The length of the sanctuary from threshold to the outer edge of the central inscribed apse is 38 meters with a width of, of 20 meters, slightly larger than our area A church. An artifact extends to three meters to the west of the western wall under a roof which is supported by four monumental columns. And an atrium extends an additional six meters to the west. The flooring in the, in the atrium is similar to that in the other churches at Abila, consisting of the larger three centimeters square primarily white tessera. Along the south side of the structure, um, uh, a number of pastophoria were located and excavated. On the outer edge of the northwest corner of the church, the baptistry was found. The flooring on both sides of the aisle of, excuse me, the flooring on both sides of the aisle is, um, both aisles and the nave is opus sectile. The narthex, pastophoria, and the baptistry all have mosaic flooring, some of which contain designs uh, of baskets of fruit, geometric designs, and floral motifs. As in the Area A church, excavators determined that after the collapse of the structure in the mid-8th century, it was used for domestic occupation into the early medieval or Abbasid period. Numbers of whole objects in the mid-8th century uh, through the 9th centuries were found in the pastophoria, primarily storage jars. Work in this church was completed in 2008. As with the Area A church, our plan is to erect a shelter over the structure and then restore and reconstruct the floor surfaces. With this uh, which in this structure is primarily opus sectile uh, in the nave, and then to do more work conserving the mosaic flooring in the pastophoria. During the, during the 1992 season, while excavating along the western edge of the atrium, uh, um, what appeared to be the top of a monumental staircase was visible from the surface. Upon further exploration, excavators landed on what appeared to be part of an apse, and, and no evidence of a staircase was found. So work there was halted until 1994 uh, when excavation resumed under the label Area DD. Work in Area DD uncovered a basilical structure measuring 19.5 meters from the threshold to the edge of the central inscribed apse and 15 meters from the edges of the north and south aisles. This is the smallest of the churches at Abila. The north and south aisles were covered in carpet mosaic flooring, uh, while the nave was paved with sheets of marble, one meter by 60 centimeters and one centimeter thick, large portions of which remained in situ. The structure is, is triapsidal, but unlike all the other churches, triapsidal churches at Abila, where the nave apse is uh, somewhat larger than the other two, in this church, all three apses are of identical size. I'm not aware of any other church structure in Jordan where the three apses are identical, and in Anne Michelle's Corpus of Transjordanian Churches and several other sources, there are no parallels. I welcome any suggestions as about the implications of this. The only distinguishing feature of the central apse is that it is raised approximately 30 centimeters with steps leading up only from the nave. Curiously, several stylobates were uncovered uh, in situ, uh, but there were no capitals, columns, or bases. And so we're assuming that this structure probably fell into disuse and was robbed out to build the basilica in area D described previously. We also found an empty sarcophagus uh, um, uh, that was uh, had been used for mixing plaster, again, probably for use in the construction of the Area D church. As with the two previously described churches, this structure also had significant domestic occupation into the early medieval period. We located both an upper and nether grindstone, numbers of ash pits, several storage containers, as well as significant pottery into the Umayyad and especially into the Abbasid period, uh, including some whole Abbasid period objects dating to the 9th and 10th centuries. Uh, 
Structural modifications to the North Island nave, um, especially with walls bisecting both, gave, ev gave evidence of the domestic use of the structure as it after it had ceased being used as a church. Significant also was the finding of no numbers of whole glass lamps uh, visible here. And a bronze ewer um, with a handle in the shape of a panther or leopard. They were sitting on 15 centimeters of soil above the church floor, and so our assumption is that they were from the church in Area D and were for some reason stashed in the, in the ruins of the Area DB church, possibly in the mid at the mid 8th century earthquake. Work in Area DD in the Area DD church was completed in 2006. Due east of the South Tell, another church structure was located in the year 2000 and was labeled Area G. Work there continues in, until today, and we expect that at least one or two more seasons of excavation will be needed to complete this area. The structure is Abila's, that's what it looked like as we, um, before we began excavation. And then in the 2004 season, and then 2012, uh, that's what was uncovered. Um, the structure is Abila's only single apse church. The structure measures 29.5 meters from the west threshold to the outer edge of the, of the salient apse and 19.5 meters from the north to the south walls. A narthex of 4.5 meters was excavated during the 2006 and 2008 seasons. The pastophoria along the south of the church uh, are still under excavation and so its dimensions are not clear yet. The nave of the church, like that of the area DD church, was paved with marble. Uh, the north and south aisles were paved with um, uh, opus tectiles, significant amounts of which remained in situ. And here's an artist's reconstruction of the pattern. Within the apse, was loca we located a, a sarcophagus, which although it had all the ceiling stones on top in place when it was uncovered, was empty. A well-preserved ambo um, situated along the southern edge of the nave, five meters west of the altar screen. Uh, the eastern end end of the south aisle ends in the, in the chancel screen, which is situated two meters from a flat wall. There was no evidence of any paint on the fragments of plaster that remained on the wall. The following reconstructions were done by Mr. Taufik Kunaiti of the Department of Antiquities um, of Jordan. Beginning in the late 1980s, Dr. Bastian Van Eldren, a former director of ACOR, led the excavation of Area B, what has been sometimes called the theater caveat. For better or worse, although the, the, the unnatural depression on the hillside would seem to indicate the presence of a theater, no architectural remains uh, belonging to a theater have been excavated. While there's a massive retaining wall that runs along the interior of the cavea, excavation along the hillside became too precarious and fear of collapse led excavators to halt work there in 2006. Before the work was halted, a large structure was uncovered um, at the base of the hillside, um, uh, which at the time uh, there were at the time the work stopped was believed to be a Christian monastic complex due to the presence of an apse on the eastern end of the uh, eastern wall of the structure. At some point, uh, work in this area will need to be resumed, but it's not currently among our excavation priorities. Um, 30 meters north of the um, monastic structure, work in the 2016 season was initiated along the basalt road that runs north-south through the site and, and bends eastward in front of the monastic structure. Features that were visible from the surface led us to hypothesize that there might be an early Islamic market or souk along the road. And similar to findings at Umkais and Bishan, uh, structures compatible with a market were found intruding into the public space of an open plaza at the base of the hill. Here's some images of um, what those look like. Pottery in these squares lying directly above the clay surface uh, dated from the fourth to the, to the eighth centuries. Interestingly, a small glass, this is more of the, of the um, images. Um, Interestingly, um, a small glass fragment, a rim and part of a neck was uncovered that had an Arabic inscription stamped on the medallion attached to the rim. Uh, we have an Arabic epigrapher working on the inscription, but a tentative reading suggests something like, there's no power except with God. Uh, numbers of parallels have been found at Bishan and studied by S. Haydad. Um, the examples from Bishan come from a market area commonly referred to as the Souk of Hisham. There's another shot of the area of encroachment onto the public plaza up to the street. Uh, 
A final area of excavation that I will discuss is the basilica in what we call Area E. This area was first located and excavated in 1990, and excavation is continued every season down to the present. We hope that with one or two more seasons, we'll be able to complete our work here. The church in Area E is triopsidal, although unlike the other churches at Avila, this one has north and south aisles, apses facing north and south, uh, respectively, in a clover leaf or cruciform shape. The structure measures 25.4 meters from the threshold to the outer edge of the central apse and 26.6 meters from the edges of the north and south walls of the sanctuary, being wider than it is long with four aisles and then the nave. To the west, a narthex measuring 5.5 meters extends to the back retaining wall that runs up against the, the, the side of the northern till. Two cisterns uh, were located in the narthex, one on the north and then the other on the south side. And then on the western wall of the on the western wall, we uncovered what appears to be a seat uh, built into the wall. Indentations on the floor of the narthex, along with smashed whole pots and objects, such as the, these seen here, give a clear indication that the structure was destroyed in the 749 earthquake. Numbers of whole objects were found in, in the, the rubble. This is actually a very nice piece. We also have, there's a cage that attaches to um, at the top as a lid um, that we found as well that was preserved separately. And then between the handle and the spout, you can see there's the uh, uh, embossed face. Um, there's two other faces on the other side. Um, uh, just a very nice, nice piece. Um, let's see. Along the south end edge of the structure, the pastophoria were excavated. Numbers of crosses were, were carved into the walls and columns, and instantly along the south wall, the three niches were located. Two of them had been filled with plaster in antiquity, leaving only one open. In informal conversations with Bethany Walker, Gideon Avney, and a few other scholars, they all confirmed my suspicions that the niche was likely a mehrab, and, possibly, and that possibly the room was used as a musala during the early Islamic period. Rina Abner's work with the Kathisma Church just outside of Bethlehem and work done at the Shifta Church in, in the Negev, as discussed by Mattia Giodetti and among a few others, give evidence of the presence of Muslim prayer spaces inside of Christian churches. To check the date, a sample of the plaster from the central niche, was, which contained three charred olive pits, was removed and sent for carbon dating. Somewhat to my surprise, the results came back with an, an even earlier date that I had anticipated. The results from the testing indicated that the olive pit had a 95.4% probability for a date between 561 and 651 CE. That is roughly a century before the church was destroyed in the 749 earthquake. In this scenario, sometime during the, the middle of the 7th century, Muslim worshippers, or to use Fred Donner's terminology, Muslim believers, filled in the two niches in the south wall of the area E church, and then used this space for prayer facing Mecca for as much as a century before the structure was finally destroyed in the earthquake. I was fairly convinced uh, that we had indeed uncovered a Muslim prayer space here, but with the date so early on the filling in of the niches, it seems less likely to me now. Uh, further testing may yield more conclusive results, um, but we'll have to wait for those. In the southwest corner of the structure, a chapel was located. The floor was paved with black and white checkerboard squares, and, and, and there was an altar screen set up in the middle uh, of the room adjacent to a small column. Throughout the church, most of the floor surfaces were paved with sheets of marble, and on many of the standing walls, there were hooks for hanging marble facing as well. A few, uh, but not many, ashlars were uncovered with um, remains of finely painted plaster on them, the colors still sharp and bright. During the 2010 season of excavation, irregularities observed on the outside of the east wall of the structure led our, our lead excavator in this area, Dr. Robert Smith, to hypothesize about the, the phasing of the structure. There's the outside of that wall. And so a probe is taken three meters on the opposite side of that wall in the interior of the church. That probe landed on a, a paved mosaic surface, and so squares were opened in the north and south aisles that revealed what we are fairly certain is an earlier church located one meter below the one being excavated. Now you can see down the central, the nave, um, about a meter down from the floor surface of the uh, cruciform church is this finely paved mosaic floor, and there's a cross in the middle of it. And on the north aisle, on the east side of the north aisle, there's an altar screen um, with uh, a cross in, in the floor in front of it. 
Um, these seem to confirm uh, the view that that, that, that that bottom floor is, is uh, related to a church structure. At present, we have no clear indication as to why the lower church might have been buried uh, to build the upper one. Work during the 2014 season of excavation down to the present has focused on the northern side of the structure. In 2016, part of an altar screen was uncovered with a carving with a carved human figure. Uh, the stone on which the icon was found appeared to have been laid deliberately, but it is not yet clear exactly uh, what reused function this might have served, if nothing more than a pagan stone. Eventually, squares on the north side of the main church structure revealed nicely paved mosaic surfaces and what appears to be a walkway around the southeast corner of an adjacent structure. At the northern end uh, of this walkway, a protrusion in the wall in a semi-circular uh, form led us to believe that we had discovered an apse. And so our hope is that there might be a baptistry attached to our area E church on the north side, as is common in the region. And indeed, as was found in our area D church. There are 12 courses of stone in situ on the apse in the adjoining wall. As can be seen in this photo, there was significant phasing in the use of the church as well. The entryway above was sealed at some point to enclose the room on the other side. From the surface footprint, footprint of the structure, we are indeed hoping to find a baptistry. As excavation progressed, it became clear that the structure had significant reuse after its ecclesial use came to an end. A wall was found that bisected the structure from the east to the west along what would have been the south side of the aisle in the nave. Um, the floor surface reached uh, in what we believe is the south side of the structure was, li was, limestone, was of li limestone pavers, and we believe that the original floor of the ecclesial structure lies about 50 centimeters below. All surfaces were plastered, and on the east wall, an Arabic inscription was found on the plaster covering the entryway that had been sealed to the passageway on the other side. A very tentative reading by our epigrapher suggests that it, it is a reference to an Ibn Omar who took part in the sealing of the doorway and the refurbishment of the structure. The final project in Area E uh, during the last few seasons was an exploration of a number of inscriptions, both Greek and Arabic, that could be found on various surfaces in the area. Until the tragic passing of Andrea Zerbini in July of 2019, he and Faras Bacain were working on the Greek and Arabic inscriptions respectively. We hope that the publication of the Greek inscriptions should be completed soon with the Arabic inscriptions following shortly thereafter. And here's a few of the Arabic inscriptions. In conclusion, uh, the excavation work being done at Abila de Capolis provides important comparative material, especially for those working the Byzantine and early Islamic periods in Jordan and beyond. I trust that the impending publication of our findings will be an aid to better understanding this important period in the history of Northwest Jordan and the region more generally. There's one final very promising development that I would like to mention as well. Beginning in the summer of 2022, the Avila Archaeological Project will be partnering with the Lanier Center for Archaeology at Lipscomb, Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. Established in 2020 by the Board of Trustees of Lip Lipscomb University, the, the Lanier Center offers both the MA and the PhD degrees in archaeology, and under the direction of Stephen Ortiz and Tom Davis, shows great promise of making a significant contribution to the study of archaeology of the Near East being done in North America. Current plans are for Tom Davis to bring a group of his students to Jordan in the summer of 2022 and under the guidance of the Department of Antiquities to begin the process of locating the most appropriate area of the site for them to begin their work. I'm confident that with this joining of resources will benefit the excavation work at Abila of the Decapolis and with Tom's expertise and the work of his students will help us to produce timely and excellent publications on the exciting finds that are at Abila of the Decapolis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, much better. And sorry about earlier. Today, it seems like that my connection is not good. So sorry yeah, about no, that. No problem. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a couple of questions, but one is uh, mine is like, when are you uh, going to resume your work at Abila? Well, we, we hope to make it to the field. Um, we excavate on even dated years. And so our last season was in 2018. Uh, 2020 was canceled because of COVID. And I'm not sure what yet's going to happen in 2022. Uh, we hope to have a full season. Usually we take about 40 student volunteers and then maybe 15 members of the senior staff. Um, 
but I'm not sure that we're going to be able to take students this year. Uh, my university is very reticent to uh, allow students to travel over the summers on officially official university sponsored trips. And so what we may end up doing is just taking the senior staff and doing um, other sorts of um, work at the site, but maybe not excavation. I'm not positive yet. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, we look forward to you come back to Jordan and we can yeah. see you and the students hopefully sometime soon. Um, yeah. Also, I was interested in knowing if you have discovered or uncovered any uh, human remains from like previous seasons or like, yeah. Yeah, we have. And actually in the area E church, the last one that I discussed, uh, under the floor surface of the church, there were um, five burials. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So um, have been, they've been studied, any results, any information on the remains or the individuals? Yeah. They were, they were likely Muslim burials. They were on their right side facing south um, uh, in that church. And so they're Muslim burials almost certainly. Um, and we've done uh, some study of them, but it's not been completed yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, what does the Abila stone say beside the name Abila? Were experts able to decipher it? Yeah, it appears to be a list on, listing of cities. Um, and Abila is, is clearly legible. Uh, Emitha is, or, or some variant of that is legible, um, but I, I don't think any other cities have been identified uh, other than those. Thank you. Um, another question, we have a couple coming in. Um, it says, what about the cave burials within the site? You did not mention anything about them, any plans? Right. Um, their, their numbers are tombs, in, especially in the Wadi Quelba on the east edge of the site. Um, they were excavated, uh, some were, many were excavated by a team of French scholars back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and we, we excavated um, up until about uh, around the year 2000. Um, but we stopped excavating any of the tombs because right now there's not the resources to be able to preserve them and maintain them in ways that would be appropriate. And so um, we've not done any, any work in the tombs uh, in the past um, almost 20 years, uh, which I think is a good thing. Um, you know, significant resources need to go into making sure that those are preserved well and, um, and, um, and that they don't decay, which is what, what's happened to the tombs that were excavated earlier. And so we do worry about looters. There's a good bit of looting that goes on at the site. And so we don't want the, the tombs to be found by the looters before we do. Uh, but um, right now we've not been excavating in the tombs. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question. Can you give um, any insight into the bridge in the center of the valley? Also, yeah. there is, yeah, I think it's two parts question. Also, there used to be a sarcophagus underneath it on the north side. Do you know what happened to that? Sargophagus on underneath side of the uh, of the Roman bridge? Sarcophagus, um, yeah. yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure what happened to the sarcophagus. It, it, it could have been looted, um, which is most likely what happened. But um, yeah, we've not done any formal excavation of the of the Roman bridge. Um, Bernard Luc has done some work there with soils. And he's he's traced the the bridge down ten meters uh, to bedrock and um, did some study of the soils that were there, soil deposition and um, and erosion at the site. Um, but we've not done any any um, excavation with the, the Roman bridge at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any future plans to do so? Well, eventually, I, I think we need to make sure and finish the projects that we've begun already first, and then it will certainly be part of the, the future of the excavation of the site. Yeah, it's a sounds, massive bridge, yeah. Yeah, it sounds interesting. So um, another question, why, do you, uh, why we don't have Iron Age burials at Abila? There are some Iron Age burials that were done uh, before we took over the site um, in the... 50s and 60s, um, uh, an archaeo a Jordanian archaeologist from Jordan University worked there, and some very nice Iron Age uh, tombs were found. Uh, during our excavation of tombs since 1980, we didn't find any uh, Iron Age burials, but um, there are some that predate our work at the site. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I think we can take a couple more questions. So this one, it says, at the time of Christ, how extensive was the city geographically in comparison with, uh, say, Gadara? Yeah, um, interesting. You know, uh, we do have a lot of Roman pottery 
we do have um, evidence that there was a significant Roman population there, but our excavation has not um, not found any Roman structures that we've excavated. We focused on the churches and have not dug below them except in a few small, small probes. And so the extent of the site during the Roman period, um, during the time of Christ, is, uh, is not entirely clear. Um, it would have been a, a, a fairly good-sized city, um, um, you know, relative to, to Gadarum case, I'd presume maybe slightly smaller. But um, yeah, that's about, yeah. Okay, I hope that answers uh, the question. So thank you for that. And also, so now I'm interested, you mentioned that there are uh, Muslim praying spaces in the churches. And this is a question for me. Um, so uh, do we know if there are any rituals um, involved to prepare these, these spaces to be used for the prayer? Or, um, you know, you mentioned that some of the niches were like blocked and one was used as a mahrab. Do we know any other prep rituals would go on? to like use these um, spaces mean, for prayers. I mean, architectural features that might might be connected, is that what you mean? Yes, or uh, also like um, ceremonial rituals. Do we have any records of that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, washing, of course, would have been important. And there's uh, significant water supplies that do run into the area E church. Um, there's a water tunnel underneath the church that um, opens in the northwest corner of the church, um, which could have been used for ritual washings beforehand. Two cisterns in the, um, in the narthex that could have been used also in that period for ritual washings before prayer. Um, but again, I'm not quite clear. Um, I would like to think that it was used as a musala while it was also used as a church contemporaneously. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that the evidence right now bears that out. Um, we do have in, in Area B what might be a musala um, that was composed of um, column drums that were set up um, uh, with an entrance on the north side, entering to the south, uh, facing south. Um, and there's also an area A, uh, just east of the uh, large basilica that there is, there's a large rectangular building with entryways on the north side entering to the south um, that could also be, um, it was built with uh, repurposed stone from the church uh, after it fell in 749. So it could be an early medieval Abbasid period um, uh, mosque structure up there on on the North Tell. And I tend to think that's what it is, but we've not excavated there yet. We'll leave that for a future team to, to work on. Fascinating, definitely. Uh, very interesting. So uh, I think there is a comment about the previous question. It seems that the DOA worked at the bridge under Waji Karasna. Yeah. So that's just uh, an, uh, information that yeah. has been shared. Good. And yeah. um, uh, another question is, um, did Aramaics live at, in Abila during the Hellenistic period? So I'm assuming Arameans or... Um, there, there is, I'm not sure exactly what that question's asking, but there, there is evidence of um, Jewish occupation at the site. You know, um, in 2016, we uncovered a, um, uh, a menorah uh, on a carved on a stone uh, in the area E church that was reused, it was repurposed. Um, but other than that, there's been uh, and possibly a menorah or two in uh, wall paintings in some of the tombs uh, from the very, very early seasons of the excavation. Uh, but other than that, um, there's been no indication, no synagogue, no mikvot or anything like that at the site yet. So the I, question, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, do, would you like to add? Um, Another thing before we move to another question. No, I, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have more questions coming in. Um, so uh, the uh, next question is, would the two theaters suggest an increase the in the population to more than 15,000 in the late Roman era? Well, I don't know. I, right now, we don't have any evidence of, a, of, a, of no excavated evidence of a theater. Um, you know, we, we assume, I mean, the, the unnatural formation of the hillside of that tell where area B is located, um, it looks like there should be a theater there, but we've not found any architectural features that would um, support that view, that would substantiate that. And so um, as of right now, there, there's no theater at Abila, which in itself is a bit unusual um, for a major decapolis city. Um, 
you know, it's possible that there's one on the east side, a smaller theater on the east side of the Wadi. Um, but as of right now, we've not excavated there. And so it's not clear. Yeah. Fascinating. There is so much more to this city. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one other question uh, is asking about the artifacts that have been uh, uncovered at the site. Where are they kept? Are they in a museum? Could they be viewed online, in person? Any information? Yeah, the art the artifacts are spread over a number of different museums. Some are at the um, Irbid Archaeological Museum. Uh, some are. Uh, at the Jordan University's uh, Archaeological Museum. Some are at the um, various DOA museums in Amman, um, and others are in storage, uh, either in Irbid at the storage um, uh, facility in Irbid or in the Amman storage facility. And so um, they're kind of spread out all over the place. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay, another question. Area B has this uh, form because of a major landslide that happens and buried structure, not because there is a theater. Might have uh, led to the area abandonment. Any comments? It's a comment. Yeah, I mean, it could, it could very, very well be. There, there's a lot of tumble at the bottom of Area B that, that came from, even from the Area D church up above uh, and other structures that were built above. And so there is column drums that have rolled down the side and um, capitals and, and uh, of course, uh, soil. And so, yeah, that, I'm sure that contributed to the um, demise of whatever use that building was, yeah. So in this case, we so far don't know if there is a theater in the city. Yeah, it's, it's not clear, yeah. Okay. Amazing. Okay, so I think uh, we've answered all the questions that they've came in. If you still have any question, please do send it in. Um, otherwise, um, I think we will come to the conclusion of the talk this evening. Um, okay, for the sake of everyone's time, I don't see any other questions. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you very much uh, for this exciting presentation and for the information that you shared with us. Very interesting. And now I plan to visit the site myself. I haven't had the chance to uh, visit the site, see it in person. Uh, for our audience, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I would like to remind you that this talk will be uh, available on our YouTube channel for you to view later on and share with your colleagues and students. Uh, with that, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Professor David Bila, for this presentation and have a nice evening or day, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.